Lord Jesus Christ. My message title this morning is Good News of Great Joy. Good News of Great Joy. And you might be wondering, where did I come up with that title? Well, I didn't come up with it. The angels came up with this title. So the verses I want to focus on this morning is really from those that wonderful passage we just heard from Brother Charlie, but I want to focus from focus on verses 18 through 14 in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, excuse me, 8 through 14. Luke chapter 2, 8 through 14. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Well, let me pray before we look at this passage and ask God for help. Lord, we are thankful and grateful but we want to also take a minute to praise and give glory to God in the highest. We want to join in the celebration that took place in the skies, in the heavens, that God was glorified in the highest and peace came to earth. So we pray that you would give us peace, a heart to hear your word, a mind to comprehend your wonderful truth, and hands that will reach out to those who are lost without hope. And so, Lord, do your work through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, about the year 380, there was a man by the name of Lucius Lactantius. I think I pronounced it right. And this man was a Roman citizen. Uh, a man who did not believe in Jesus Christ. And it is said that he had later converted to Christianity. And so this man, Lucius, uh, became a scholar and had later became a tutor of the emperor's son at that time in 300 AD. And so Lucius wrote, historically we, we can see this record in a book that he had written, he wrote that the census, we just heard from verse 1, Luke chapter 2, that was a, there was a decree, a command, an edict, uh, a, a command that went out from Caesar, from the Roman emperor, to conduct a census that the world should be registered, meaning all the people should be registered. And so this man, Lucius, wrote about the census that took place during that time. And some of us, some of you had... Uh, recently filled out a census uh, two years ago, I believe, or maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, you got a mailer, and you filled it out and mailed it back. And Or maybe some of you had someone knock the door and fill, fill it out for you. And so you know the census uh, that took place in the year 2020. Uh, Lucius writes in his own words that uh, the census during the time of uh, the Roman occupation, or at least before that, before during the time of Caesar Augustus, perhaps, was nothing like our census in our time. And this is what he writes in his own words, open quote, The Roman census was nothing like our census. The, it was the greatest calamity and general sorrow was the census imposed on the provinces and the cities. Census officers were posted everywhere, and under their activity, Everything was like a hostile invasion or grim captivity, end quote. And why was it that way? Lucius further writes that families, parents, and children, and servants were treated so 
horribly. The whole business of census was for one purpose, to collect taxes from everyone, especially the poor, the weak, the aged, and uh, the weak people who could not. So age was inflated. All people, or even people who were dying, were taxed. And so the Roman rule was one of oppression, tyranny, and deceit. Uh, that was the public policy of Rome during that time, Lucius writes. And so here, as I said, as we saw in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, in the beginning of the passage, this command went out from the Roman emperor, Augustus, Caesar, as he is called. And we also see, during this time, all the people had to go to their hometowns to be registered. What that means is they had to put in their name so that taxes could be collected from the people. And then you see Joseph and Mary also going from the town of Nazareth to the town of Bethlehem. And this was not an easy trip, as if you could take a, take a car and then drive to the next town and then stay in a motel. This was not an easy trip for them. It was, it was already a, a very oppressive time for the general population. But then Mary and Joseph, uh, to add to the complication of their trip, Mary was carrying. Mary was having a child. And she was not in the first month of her pregnancy. She was just about ready to give birth when all of this happened. They were traveling for the census, and Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem, and Mary was just ready to have the baby. And so they go to this place, Bethlehem, which is also called the city of David, because as we are told, it is of the lineage of their forefather, David. And really, Bethlehem, today we sing songs, Bethlehem is really a small, insignificant village at that time. So to consider the scenario, the context of Mary and Joseph traveling for the census and ready to have their baby, and they just can't find room to have the baby. And Bethlehem was not like a next door Eugene or one of the places that you can find a motel and check in and you'll have all the medical facilities like we do in our day. And so as they were looking for a place to have the baby, they just could not find an inn. The word inn is really not a public motel. It was just a family room, uh, a place that someone could invite them and stay. Uh, hospitality was big during those days because people lived in small communities. People cared for each other. So you could not refuse to use someone, especially if they were having a baby. And so, as they were looking for a, babe, uh, a room for the baby, they could not find anything. And they had to find some room somewhere. And usually rooms that the word in is translated, I mean, it's translated from the word cataluma. It's usually a, a one-room house. That, ha that had two parts in that house. One part was for was called the living area, which was elevated from the other part of the house, uh, which was there to keep the animals. So you imagine one room, maybe a, a five by five or a 10 by 10, and having two parts in it, one place for the animals and an elevated place for the family. And then you see in the opening parts of Luke chapter two, that family area was occupied, that was full. So to make this even more complicated, Mary did not have room even in that family area. So they had to settle for that area where animals were kept. This is the scenario, this is the scene that unfolds before us in Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. And so these days we, and we also have a Christmas song that tells us that uh, there was no place for him in the crib. And perhaps that's a mistranslation. In a, and you also see this word manger, perhaps an accurate translation today in English, manger. And, and again, this crib or manger is not the real nice bassinets or crib that we have today. 
not the plush blankets and the cloths that we have today. You can change them by the hour and recycle, I mean, put them in the washer or bring new ones for the baby. Uh, this was uh, a place that animals were placed, animals were kept, and usually historians say that the, the manger, as it is called, was an area that was carved into the wall of that room, that little room there. It was usually an area, a niche in the room uh, of the wall or on the floor. So imagine maybe uh, Mary having this baby and then uh, placing the baby in that niche. Where in, and it was the manger that she was placing the baby in. And that manger was usually a trough where animals you, uh, were fed with water or any of that food. So really, if you see, Jesus was born in to this poor young family in a lowly place in a small insignificant town called Bethlehem and he was placed in that place called Manger. And not a very fashionable place that you see on Christmas, Christmas cards. And nothing really spectacular about the birth of Jesus as we uh, or saw described here in verses 1 through 7. But then... As you see, this whole birth of Jesus is one of low-key, very insignificant compared to worldly standards. Nothing really special about it. It's a commonplace birth. The room was really sort of rented out. Uh, people who, lab laborers or farm workers or peasants used to live in that one-room house. And so Mary had her baby there. So really nothing spectacular about it. And yet, I say yet because this, meaning the birth of Jesus, is the most, I say most, superlative. Because it is the most momentous moment in the history of the world. Three reasons for us. Why is it so significant? It is so significant because a heavenly celebration was just about to break out from the heavens, from the sky. We'll see that in a minute. Yeah, and that is how significant this moment was, the birth of Jesus Christ. It is also significant because we know from history that history is divided into two parts, before Christ and after the death of Christ. Some people call it CE. But again, we know from historical records that usually we refer to history as the, the birth and the death of Christ, before Christ and after Christ. So this Christmas morning, or rather the day after Christmas, I have four questions for us, and we will finish our morning service. Four questions to us in light of the birth of Jesus Christ. As you saw in, the, in verse in chapter 2 and verse 10, the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. That is really the, the message title. And so question number one is, why is the birth of Jesus good news? Second question, how is the birth of Jesus Christ good news? And third question I want to attempt to answer is, to whom is this good news intended? And what is the audience? And the last one is, what are you to do with this good news? And so in my attempt to answer these questions as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, as to the first one, why is the birth of Jesus Christ good news? And the answer to that question, this is not, again, all-inclusive. The birth of Jesus Christ is good news, because without Jesus, humanity is destined to die, decay, and be condemned. Now, if you're hearing this, uh, you might be wondering, I may agree with the first two parts, de die and decay, sure. You know, there are many people who do not believe in God, who are prof uh, professing atheists or even agnostic people, though, who don't care about they don't care if there's a God or not, they would agree with all of these first two things with saying, yes, we know that humanity will die and decay. You know, man has a very short time span, hundreds, 
perhaps 120, very rare to have 120. And so they will agree, but as to the third part, perhaps they will hold back and say, well, we do not agree about that the world is condemned. And again, the good news is good news because there is the news of condemnation before the good news comes to these angels. You see, this condemnation is something that we all live in already, whether or not you disagree. I mean, especially if those who do not agree uh, if they do not believe in God. And so, and you, uh, one of the questions I had as I was preparing this, it, you, you know that there is a law and order system in this world, yes? Why is it that you are penalized if you go 100 miles per hour in a 50 mile zone? Why should you be paying the consequences of such a high speed? We all agree that there are consequences, there are penalties, there's judgment, there is going to be some consequence that will come if we are caught with such an offense. And so you see, it is not too difficult for you to comprehend that there is a divine law as there is a human law, human judges and human, um, humans have made law, but then there is also a divine law and a divine judge. God, as the Bible tells us, is offended by the actions of humanity. God is offended by your actions and mine. Psalm, Psalm, the book of Psalm, chapter 7, 11, tells us that God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. And this might be surprising to you because we, you, you thought God was just a God of love and love and love. Yes! 100% amen, God is a God of love. But the Bible also tells us that, God, that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And so what we find out in, in, this, uh, in this first answer to the first question is that we, the birth of Jesus Christ is good news because we live in a world of condemnation. We live in a world that has already been condemned, accursed. And I can't go into the details, but a few weeks ago we saw that uh, the passage from John chapter, uh, one of the uh, wonderful passages from John, I don't have the exact chapter in mind, but it's, uh, it's, it's saying, whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, Jesus, the words of Jesus Christ. And so, the birth of Jesus Christ is good news because without Jesus, humanity is destined to decay, die, and be condemned. And where you see here, the angel comes and appears before the shepherds in verse 8, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field and they were watching the flocks by night. And so what you see here is when the angel appears to them, you see something that we don't see today, but is only described to us. The glory of the Lord shone around them and you see the reaction of the shepherds. What is the reaction of the shepherds? They were filled with a great fear. Let me, let me try to unpack this for us. The glory and the presence of God is so great and too terrifying for man and woman to witness. And so that is why you see the reaction of these people. While the shepherds were filled with a great fear. You know, a literal translation of this verse says it this way. The shepherds feared a great fear. The, the word used in Greek is they were filled with a mega fear. A great fear. And so why is that? Why were they filled with a great fear? It is because the presence of God is terrifying. All throughout the Bible, people who have experienced the divine presence were terrified. It is not that God wants to terrify people, but it's the nature of God that is really awesome. It is too far for humans to comprehend. 
You know, there was a king in the Old Testament during the time of the prophet Daniel. His name is Belshazzar. And Belshazzar did not honor God. He stole items, things that were meant for worship, and he dishonored God. And so one day a finger appears to write the words of God, giving a warning. He could not understand it, but you see the reaction of this king Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5, verse 6. He tells us the, that when the king saw the writing on the wall, this is how he reacted. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. Well, see, this is how this king, a ruler of the Persian king, the Babylonian kingdom, felt, sensed when he saw God, God's presence come down to him. And I say this because I think people have such a domesticated view of God. You know, it's almost like people can summon God at their beck and call, but what we see here, the shepherds reacting with fear and terror when God's glory appears to them. And you probably rem remember C.S. Lewis, the great author in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, gives us a good illustration about the right fear of God. And so he writes, uh, in one of the passages he writes about Aslan, the lion, which is compared to God or Jesus. And I want to quote this passage from this book. Um, begin quote, Aslan is a lion as it describes there, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? The lady asked, the girl asks. I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And then Mrs. Beaver says to Susan, that you will, dearie, and make no mistake. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then isn't he safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear that Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But hear this, but he is good. He's the king, I tell you, end quote. So you see here the nature of God. This is exactly what the shepherds experienced, the frightening, terrifying Glory of a good God. Just like Aslan was described, God is like the lion, terrifying. Is he not, he's not safe, but he is good. He is great. And so even though the shepherds greatly feared the presence of God, the angel's intent was not to terrify them, not to instill fear in them, and that they did not come to condemn the world that had already been cursed and condemned. The angel was dispatched by God to bring good tidings, bring good news to them. And so what does the angel tell the shepherds? They reacted with fear, and the angel assures them something else. That leads to me to the second question, the first question is, why is the birth of Jesus good news? And my answer was, the birth of Jesus is good news because without Jesus, there is death, decay, and condemnation. The second question is, how is the birth of Jesus good news? Look at verses 10 and 11. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Well, here you see the reason this is good news because of a Savior. So the answer to the question, how is the birth of Jesus good news? The reason, the answer to that question is because a Savior has been born. A Savior has been revealed to humanity. And what kind of a Savior is Jesus? And we see the answer right here. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior who is a Redeemer, a Deliverer, a Rescuer. A someone who is able to rescue humanity from their darkness, from their decay and death. 
and condemnation and judgment from the, the fatal condition that inhabits humanity, which is sin and its penalty. And so when the angel said to the shepherds, I bring to you good news of great joy for, meaning because a Savior has been born who is Christ the Lord. What does it mean that he is Christ the Lord? What, what the angel is saying to the shepherd, he, the, he's saying that Jesus is the Messiah that has been long awaited. People have been waiting for him, the people in that region, and he says he is also the Lord. That means he is co-equal with God himself. And now notice what the angel tells the people. He says, do not fear. See, many times in the, in, the, all the, in, the, in the whole book, in the whole books of the Bible, we see, fear not, fear not, fear not. I bring you good news. And again, this is of so much practical, we could use it, there's so much practical implication from these verses. And if you're someone who is experiencing fears and anxiety in this world or in your life, fear of the future, fear of the present, Fear that your past might catch up with you. Fear of the unknown. This is what God, through his messenger, through the angel, is saying to you as well. And also to the shepherds saying, Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. And so how is this good news of great joy? Verse 11, Because to you this day is born a savior and again people talk about a lot of saviors in this world this is a unique savior a savior who was born and who can deliver you from your greatest fear and what would be that greatest fear it is death and condemnation someone said death is the greatest enemy and so this savior is able to rescue from our greatest fear you know i saw an, uh, an advertisement for a cell phone company that had its phrase, a catchphrase that said, you name it, we will fix it. And I think there's a cell phone repair company that says, I, we fix it or I fix it. And so the Savior here that was born today is saying, you name your greatest fear, I will rescue you. I will redeem you. I will make your fears go away. Fear not, is, that, is what this Savior is offering. And this Savior offers forgiveness of sins once and for all. Isn't that amazing? Once and for all, past, present, and future, he offers forgiveness, permanent, permanent forgiveness of sins for everyone. And so the first two questions we looked at, why is it good news? And the second one, how is it good news? Because to you this day a Savior has been born. And the third question is to whom is the good news intended? And you might think this good news was only for the shepherds, and so the angel is very careful to deliver this message and say, look at verse 10, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for what? Only for the shepherds? Only for some people in 2,000 years ago? But for all the people. How wonderful is this, the scope of this good news? This is for all the people. You know, last night we had uh, a quite a diversity of ethnicities at our home. We had some folks from Nigeria, from, uh, from Jewish background, and some India, from some India. And so you look at the scope of this message. The angel is someone uh, dispatched by God. is saying, shepherds, this is not just for you. This is not only just for you to receive and go home. This is for everyone, people of all kinds, young and old, rich and poor, you know, uh, people who are weak and strong, the kings and the peasants, for everyone in and in between. And so the intended audience is that this good news for, is for all the people. And last question is, we looked at why is this good news, how is this good news, and to whom? Is this good news intended? And the last but not the least, what are you to do with this good news? Perhaps the most important question. What are you to 
do when you hear this good news? Well, the answer comes into uh, it comes into what the shepherds did with this good news. But you answer the question, you receive the good news with a particular attitude of heart. You receive this good news with humility. The good news is for those who are poor in spirit. God looks at those who are humble in heart. You know, all, when I was studying this passage, I asked myself, you know why God sent a message to these lowly shepherds first? He could have sent this message to kings, to aristocrats, to people of high prestige, but he sent it to these people who were just grazing uh, their sheep. You know, the answer is because they were humble people. They were meek people. And the shepherds here were to look for a sign. They were asked to look for two specific symbols about the baby. But before I give that the, uh, give us the two symbols I, I, I answered this question with saying this news is to be received with humility because this is what God looks at in, in, the, in the condition of the heart you know Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 tells us God lives in a high and holy place he says the high and lofty one who lives in eternity he is God in the highest but he also lives with those who are humble and contrite in spirit. Let me read that verse. I live in a high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. You know, you see the, the condition of the shepherds here. The God knew who exactly will receive this message because those with a lowly heart, those with a meek heart, those with a humble heart, those who are ready to receive with humble hearts with no baggage. So these people were able to receive this message. And so the angel tells them this good news. And in verse 12, the angel tells them, you need to go and I'll give you a sign as to who this baby is, what are you to look for? You'll find a baby. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And you may imagine if this news came to a, a prominent wealthy figure. This would be too much for them to stoop into the manger, isn't it? After all, the baby was in a place where animals were being fed. And so if the message came to a guy who was riding a horse carriage, it would be too much for them to stoop down and go into the lowly one room where animals were there, people were not dressed properly. And so God sent the message to the right people to go to the right place. And that's why it came to this message. These shepherds would have no issues going to the manger. So the angel tells them, you are to look for the baby with swaddling cloths and that will be in a manger. And you know this is the sign that God gave to the shepherds. But you know the word manger and swaddling cloths is very profound because God give, gave these people a sign and God also gives us a sign. The sign begins with the birth of Jesus but the sign does not end with the birth of Jesus. Do you know that cloths were used to wrap the body of Jesus after he had died and had took, taken his body down? You know what Jesus, when Jesus had died, when the, he had been crucified, he, his body was taken down and um, spices were put on his body. And so cloths were used to wrap him at his birth, but also cloths were used to wrap him at his burial. But you know, those cloths could not hold his dead body. So on the third day after his death, Jesus rose from the grave. Peter, the disciple of Jesus, he runs with John into the tomb. You know what he finds in the tomb? This is very interesting. John chapter 20, verse 6. Then Simon Peter came 
following him, meaning John, and went into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths lying there, the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. You see the sign that God had given to all of humanity, not the sign of the birth, but also the sign of the death and the empty tomb. The cloths are a sign for us to believe in, not just the sign about the baby, but also the sign of his death and empty tomb. This is a sign. But here the shepherds received this message, this good news from heaven, and so before they were they could comprehend it before they could even catch a breath, the celestial celebration breaks out. Did you hear that? You know, they received this message saying, Behold, I bring to you good news of great joy. You see this sign, you'll go and find a baby. Go and find this baby, and you know how to find this baby because this baby will be wrapped in swaddling cloths and will be in a manger in this room. And before they can even catch their breath, a huge celebration breaks out. Look at verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace and on earth, peace among with whom he is pleased. You know the word suddenly is like there was an instant celebration. The whole heavens lit up because of the birth of Jesus Christ. This is how the celebration was. People did not know it. Shepherds knew it. And the whole host of heaven. And this language is really a language of, that symbolizes the armies of heaven broke out. And it celebrated because the Son of Heaven, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, was born in human flesh. And the word suddenly is also used when Paul was traveling on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians, and suddenly a light shone upon him. This is how God broke out into the lives of the shepherds and also Paul. And what were these heavenly hosts doing? The armies, the multitude, thousands and thousands of armies of God, what were they doing? They were giving glory to God. They were bringing, bringing peace to the earth. And so as the celebration breaks out in heaven, and I won't go into verses 15 and 20, we see the shepherds going away and finding the baby just as they were told. And now the one thing that to, to notice in particular is the way the shepherds went. It says that they went with haste. They went with a sense of urgency. So perhaps they left their animals there or said, let's go now and find this baby that was born today. Dear friends, do you have this urgency to find Jesus Christ in your heart? Do you make haste to say, I want to have Jesus. I want to have this peace. God wants to bring peace on earth with whom he is pleased. He wants to be pleased with you. But the attitude require, he requires is that meekness and humility. But you see, the shepherds did, all, did not also go with haste. They also began telling other people about this event. But in finally, in verse 20, we see that the shepherds return to their places with a particular condition of their hearts. The transformation is so obvious. They greatly feared, and the, the angel said, Do not fear, I bring you good news of great joy. And they received the good news with joy and humility. Their hearts were transformed. Look at verse 20. What does it say? And the shepherds returned and glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Do you know what happens when you receive this good news of great joy? This is what happens. Peace invades your heart. Peace reigns in your heart and your fear is turned into praise. 
You became an instrument of praise. You become a person who rejoices God. You begin praising and giving glory to God. Your fear turns into joy. Your anxieties are gone. Calmness and peace begins flowing through you, inside of you, from God. So as we end this morning message, and I want to, we want to summarize what we just saw. We saw the first question, why is this good news? Because without Jesus, there is only death and condemnation. But this is not a time for condemnation. This is good news of great joy. And how is this good news? Because to you this day, meaning 2,000 years ago, a Savior has been born. And how and who is to receive this good news? Everybody, anybody is to receive this good news. And, and what are you to do after receiving this good news? Is perhaps the question for you. Never receive this good news with the condition that these shepherds received. Will you receive this good news with the same, in the same way these shepherds received it? They went with haste. They found the baby. And their hearts were filled with joy and praise. And they returned praising God with a joyful heart. Would that be your experience today? Now I want to read something an early church father had written about the incarnation, about the birth of Jesus Christ. Athanasius, who had also lived in 300s, AD 300, wrote, wrote this about the birth of Jesus Christ. And so if you would listen to these few words from this early church father, this is what he wrote about Jesus. He, meaning God, saw the reasonable race, the race of men that, like himself, expressed the Father's mind, wasting out of existence and de death reigning over in corruption. God saw that corruption held us all the closer because it was the penalty for the transgression. He saw, too, how unthinkable it would be for the law to be repealed before it was fulfilled, he saw, meaning God saw, how the surpassing wickedness of men was mounting up against them. He also saw their universal liability to death. All this he saw, pitying our race, moved with compassion for our limitation, unable to endure that death should have the mastery rather than his creatures should perish and the work of his own father for us men come to naught. This is what he did, the Son of God. He took to himself a body, a human body, even as our own. And then what did he do? He took on our body. And thus taking a body like our own, because all our bodies were liable to the corruption of death, he surrendered his body to death instead of all and offered it to the Father. This he did out of sheer love for us, so that in his death all might die and the law of death thereby be abolished, because having fulfilled in his body that for which it was appointed, it was thereafter voided of its power for men and women. This he did that he might turn again to incorruption men who had turned to corruption and make them alive through death by the appropriation of his body and by grace and his resurrection. Thus he would make death to disappear from them as utterly as straw from fire. I love the last verse that he said. He says he wants to make the greatest fear which is death to disappear from us as utterly as straw from fire. And that